Richard White, Senior BIM Consultant for Man and Machine, and today we're going to do, look into a little bit of an introduction to Level of Information Need and BS EN 17412-1. What we're going to look into is why Level of Information Need is now important to the uh, uh, BIM delivery uh, process and understanding how this fits into the wider exchange information requirements. So let's just have a quick understanding of what level of information need is and why we need it. When we look back at PASS 1192 Part 2, um, level, of, uh, level of definition was originally de uh, defined as part of the uh, combination between level of information and level of detail. This is looking at both non-graphical and graphical information that's required for the delivery process of a project. Moving into the, the um, a new wave of uh, information documentation around ISO 19650, we've moved away from level of model definition and moved more into the terminology called level of information need. Within ISO 19650 part one, level of information need is described as um, focusing on each individual information deliverable and determining the need and purpose for that information. And that's everything from its use, who's going to use it, who's going to produce it, and how it's going to be produced. And this can be measured in a, a number of different ways through different metrics um, and looking at the granularity of the information that's being produced. And that's everything from our model information, which may be our geometrical information, all the way through to our alphanumerical information, parameter sets as an example, and then our documentation to be included as well. And these need to be described clearly within a set of information requirements. And these can be described in different, uh, different stages of a project, um, normally during the inception, um, in anything from the organisational information requirements through the asset information requirements, and then directly into the project. So BSEN 17412-1 was released in November 2020 and now covers some, uh, um, some clear uh, defined requirements setting out the needs of the, um, the level of information need deliverables um, and is broken down into some key factors that need to be considered as part of this information requirement deliverable. These are typically broken down into sort of four key areas. First, why? Why are we producing this information? What's the purpose of this information that we're producing? Second will be when the delivery milestones in which this information needs to be delivered. Who? Who needs to deliver this information and who is it being delivered to? Um, this is commonly known within this document as actors, but may also be referred to as parties when, within ISO 19650. And then how and what? So what are we actually delivering and what are the methods to actually produce that information? And that's kind of breaking down the deliverables. When we look at the first three sort of key areas, uh, all, of, all four of those key areas, we'll be considering um, specific elements of, those, uh, of these uh, moving forward. So the, in the first instance, the why, we're considering the actual use of that information. We're going to be specifying what's needed and in relation to its purpose and its use on the project. Um, it may also be that various bits of information may have multiple uses and that should also be considered as part of that delivery. When we're looking at the when, we're wanting to ascertain what information is needed to perform a process or task, and what information is, produ is produced at the different milestones throughout the life of a project. Um, it may be that mo more detail is needed earlier, um, or even um, as we go into a handover process, a trimmed down version of the wider project information model should be provided at a later stage for a specific use later on. When we're looking at the people involved, we need to consider both who is going to produce this information and who's going to receive the information for those uses. Um, and we also want to think about whether or not there are multiple people that may need access to this information moving forward. And then finally, looking at the how and what area, looking at breaking down our delivery, we want to consider the ways in which um, this information should be organised and broken down into its component parts um, and how um, it should be delivered uh, to each one of those actors or parties for the purpose that we've already ascertained earlier on. So when we're starting to look at the breakdown and the delivery, we would then consider the three core areas that we mentioned earlier. The geometrical information, this is our 3D modelling information or even sometimes including our 2D information as part of a wider model. 
are alphanumerical information. This might be parameters, this might be information data, this might be metadata that, con that is contained within our uh, uh, consolidated model environment or even part of the wider delivery process. And then we have documentation. So this is some of our handover information that we will need to hand over at various different gateway stages of the project. Um, and that can be anything from reports to warranties um, through even some of our, draw, uh, our 2D drawing outputs. Now within, ISO, uh, within uh, BSE and 17412, the, these three core uh, deliverables within the breakdown are also broken down into small areas. And this is how we might want to consider starting to specify these key elements as part of this delivery process. So let's start looking at the geometrical information. Historically, within uh, PAS 1192, there was a lot of focus around the level of detail, and this is now not the only part that needs to be considered as part of the geometrical information. When we're looking at level of detail, we may be looking at the overall view of a building, um, considering the different stages it might be delivered from. As you can see in the, um, on the screen, we might have different levels of detail that are required at different stages of a project. But we also need to think about the levels of complexity of individual elements within a building and what those uses, what they may be used for. So as an example here, we have three doors, each of which are all um, providing uh, an inf information around a door, but each one has a different purpose. The first being purely from a structural opening point of view, the second one looking at space planning and um, views between diff two different spaces, and the third one much more detailed showing visualisation needs. Moving on to the next part, we need to consider the dimensionality of those uh, those objects and the model itself. There, are there may be specific elements within the, within the project that need to be considered in um, different levels of dimensionality. Everything from pure location information through surfaces and areas and linear distances and then into our volumetric spaces and 3D models. After that, we also need to consider where they are in, the, in real world space. So we've, um, we have a description around three core, uh, core ways of describing this, um, which will be absolute location, which is where it, it physically exists in, um, in a real world, or, uh, real world space in, in relation to potentially something like GPS, um, a relative space in relation to something else, and uh, potentially also looking at its orientation and then reference information. So if we're using the likes of grids or reference um, planes within a project, um, we may want to reference the location of an object to another location. This might include things like levels as well. We've also got to consider the appearance of an object. So we'll be using, again here using a door as an example, we may have different purposes for that information being produced. So everything from use of clash detection, where the, the actual appearance of the object isn't necessarily that important, um, all the way through to um, elemental review, looking at the materials in which that door is made of, um, and also visualisation purposes for client engagement and the like of moving forward. Then we also have parametric behaviours. So this is also tying in the ways in which we want to modify and change the uh, geometry in relation to uh, the parameters that exist within each one of those objects or even the overall building. This may be described as explicit geometry, where they tend to be fixed shape and size, constructive geometry, which is normally modified directly through um, the modification of um, the, the solid geometry that exists within an object, or if we're moving on to the sort of final stage, that would be parametric geometry. So defining a shape by the, through the use of controlled variations and variables within a parameter of an, of an object or a building. Once we've gone through all the geometrical objects, we then consider some of our alphanumerical areas. So this will be looking at the parameter data that will be associated to our objects and to our buildings for the project delivery. Um, and in the first instance, we're going to be looking at identification. Now, identification can be formed in many different ways, and on screen we can see that we've got a few different ways in which we can classify identification for either the, the overall project, particular bits of information, um, or even individual objects moving forward. So we have everything from naming strategies, um, numbering systems that may be appointed by um, a, a, a specific uh, a design system or even by the appointed party. We've got things like classification systems, which might include uniclass. Um, and then we've got reference structures, um, so key bits of parameter data that need to be included as part of a handover process, such as COBE or IFC deliverables. 
So when we're looking at this identification, what's something that we should bear in mind is some of these um, requirements are actually also covered within the UK National Annex. So the likes of Uniclass 2015 as a classification system is actually stipulated by, Uni by the UK National Annex as a, as a recommended system to use for classification of objects, um, systems, um, entities, uh, even all the way through to roles and activities on a project. And then we also have our standardised naming structure, um, which is also included within here as well. Um, obviously, n more recently, this has been updated to, a, uh, to be more flexible. Um, so we actually now have things, um, uh, as an example, we have our volumes and our levels now being represented by our functional uses of the building and our spatial uses of the building, as well as some other modifications to the National Annex. We also need to think about the information content. What information is actually being included as part of that process deliverable and who's going to use it? So we need to consider how um, the information that we're producing is related to the purpose of that information and also who it's being handed over to in the end with regard to operational activities. So these can be some key factors around making sure that we're, produ we're, we're producing the right information at the right time for the right people. And then lastly, we move on to documentation. Now, when we talk about documentation, most people think about models and drawings being the only things that we need to include as part of a BIM deliverable. But actually, what we need to consider is um, the wider view of uh, classifying information in a structured manner. And this can be anything from reports through to our um, operations and maintenance manuals at handover, through even things like ph ph photographs and sketches within a project. Making sure that these are classified and labelled correctly within a common data environment will allow teams to be able to access and retrieve those much easier as they go on. So when we're specifying these requirements, we need to include the needs of these within our um, EIR uh, setup. So looking through everything from our organisation information requirements at the high level, looking from a client's perspective as to what they want from the project, through our asset and project deliverables, um, which will be classifying um, the needs and uses of those objects and parameters moving forward into our exchange information requirements. Each one of these have an influence on the information that's being produced um, throughout the capital delivery process within our project information model through into our operational and maintenance process in our asset information model deliverable. By capturing this information early means that we can ensure that we are providing a good quality information, we're specifying exactly what we need at an early stage to make sure it's being delivered correctly. So in, a set, in essence, what we're trying to do is keeping it simple, making sure we're asking for what we need and only producing the information that is required for that person, for that purpose and for that deliverable so that we don't get into the situation where all of a sudden we have a whole load of information that is being produced that is not needed is not required for the project um, and um, it's a, a lot of work for somebody to then read through and categorise for operations and maintenance handover. Hopefully that's been helpful for you. Thanks for your time.